come up, I want to go to Yeshiva, I have one right down the street. Yeah. Lama Beza Medalif, 32A. Towards the top of the page. Amalia Bayelir of Yosef. The line starts with the word Bar Yaakov, and the last two words is Amalay. Yeah? Okay, Omar Lay, Abaye led of Yosef. Abaye told of Yosef. So where we are is that the Gemara told us last week that the Shimon ben Lazar observed four things from Rabbi Meir with respect to his mezuzahs. Number one, he observed that he used to write it on the dulsustos, which is the inside membrane of the the inside membrane of the um, of the uh, skin as opposed to the outside. That's the first thing. Number two, that he would write it very a narrow column. Right? Number three, that it was spaced at the top of the bottom, the amount of space to be able to clip the parchment to the board so you can write properly. That's number three. Number four, that his parshias, the ending, the, the space between sh- the first parsha, which ends with Shiracha, and the beginning parsha, the next parsha, which begins with Ahaya, was on two separate lines. It was open. It was an open ended parsha. It was Psuchas. Yeah? Remember this? Okay, and the Gemara went back and forth as to which is what we do which, today, right? Well, today we have a we have a combination of both, as I showed you, right? So we have the open oh, end, the open end, and the next right. A, a, a ordinary an ordinary opening would be right there. Would the next line would start there? Was it here? Then yeah. So it seems like he started in the next line right here, okay. and leaving this side open, leaving the end of the first parsha open. And we talked about how because in the Torah, it's actually closed. But he did it open because they're not near each other. The two parshas of Shema and Vahim Shema are not near each other in the Torah. At any rate, we had the statement from Rav Hanan and of Rav, which said that the halacha follows Yishim ben Lazar. The halacha follows Rav Shim ben Lazar's observations of Rav Meir, which contradicted that, which Rav Huna did, because Rav Huna specifically had a closed break between the two parshas. And the Gemara therefore said that when Rav said the halacha follows Yishim ben Lazar, he wasn't talking about all four observations. He's talking about one observation specifically. Namely, the one which says you have to have, space, you have, to have a margin at the top and the bottom of your mezuzah, at least big enough to be able to hold, to clip the parchment down and write. So the other observations are not to be taken halakhically, at least in this understanding at the moment. And when Nav said that Allah follows Rabbi Shem ben he was talking about the, the clips, the space, at the top and the bottom of your, of your mezuzah, which is tiny, a small little space, just enough to hold it down so you can write. Okay, so now Abai is going to tell Rabbi Yosef, Proving that this is, or actually proving that this is the case. How so? So Amale Abaye of Yosef. Abaye told of Yosef, "Va'atay Tizbra, would you not agree?" The Chi Amar Rav, that when Rav said, "The Allah follows Reb Shimon ben Elazar," Arevach, that he's speaking about the space and the margin at the top and the bottom of the mezuzah, as opposed to the spacing between the two parshas. How would I know that? Because Vahar Rav is Slimin Haga. Because Rav is of the view, excuse me, that a minig, a custom is held. The way people practice, the way many, the way multiple or the majority or every, all Jews practice remains that which remains the halacha. And therefore, it could not be that Rav would say the halacha follows Rabshim ben Lazar, even though Rabshim ben Lazar predates Rav by a few generations. Two probably. Two generations, right? Rav learned from Rabbi Yechanan, which learned from Yehuda so maybe two and a half, three generations. So Rav would not say that Allah follows Shem ben Lazar, which is a few generations before him, if it is in contrary, if it's, if it's in contrast to the custom. And the Gemara is going to prove in a moment how we know that Rav is of the view that customs take precedent. But before the Gemara gets that, the Gemara says, Wahidna, but now, Nog Alma, it's the custom of everybody, Bistumois, that the parsha should be written in closed fashion, not open. That the spacing be open, uh, open. The spacing be closed rather than open. And as we saw last week, from Toysus and from our custom, that it's kind of a mixture of both, where we have an open end at the first line, and the next line begins not at the beginning of the line. Normally, an open parsha would mean that the next section begins at the beginning of the next line, whereas ours begins with like a tab. You know, like when you hit tab on your. An indentation. Yeah, an, ind- an indentation, that's right. So it's kind of a hybrid, and that's what uh, Teresius makes the note of. At any rate, so the point here being 
the Rav would not say that the halacha is that you must have an open ended spacing at the end of the mezuzah because the custom today is not to have an open ended spacing at the mezuzah, to have a stumas, to have a closed one. Whether it's like our version, like Taisa said, or like the way maybe back then they actually did have a full closed spacing where the ending of the first paragraph was the same line as the beginning of the next paragraph from space in the middle. Perhaps that was the case then. So now let's see how do we know that Rav is of the view that customs uh, uh, outweigh any other consideration. And here the Gemara introduces us to a whole new law. The Gemara says like this. To Amar Rabba, Rabba, Amar Rav Kana, Amar Rav, Rabba, said in the name of Kana, who said in the name of Rav. In Yovel Leo, if Mashiach were to come, and Elijah the prophet is to come and tell us halacha, teach us halacha. I think I mentioned this before that uh, teku, which means an unresolved question, we were taught that as an acronym for Tishbi Yitaretz Kushis Vaboyes. Eliyahu will come and answer all questions and concerns. So Eliyahu comes and informs us of what all the things we were uncertain about for all this time. So now he says the Gemara, says Rav, Rabba, son of Khan, telling the name of Khan and the name of Rav, that if Eliyahu knows he's to come and he's informing us of all kinds of laws that we were uncertain about, and he'll tell us, one must do chalitza with a shoe. Or one may do chalitza with a shoe. One may do chalitza with a shoe. Shoem and Loya, Shoem and would listen to him. I'll translate literally and I'll explain. Ein chalitza besandal. If he said you may not do chalitza with a sandal, Ein Shoem and we don't we don't listen to him. Why? Shekar no go on besandal because it's already become the custom to use a sandal as opposed to a shoe. Okay, so this is referring to men. Sandal's the same word in English as in English. Yes, yes. sandal. That. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so the, well, I'll get to. Uh, in a moment, I'll tell you the exact specific definition of what distinguishes a shoe versus a sandal and a lacha. So, the chalitza is a mitzvah, it's a din, with respect to a fellow who passes on without any children, and his brother-in-law, his wife's brother, is required to marry him, unless they do a special divorce ceremony which preempts the marriage, called chalitza. And the way chalitza works, the, 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 the ceremony, the rite, the rite as an R-I-T-E, like a ritual, is that Husband, the husband's brother. Husband's brother has to marry her. Oh no, not his brother-in-law. Sorry, yeah, yeah. he has to marry his sister-in-law. Yeah, that's marry correct. His yes, yes, that would be weird. Yeah. His brother. <laughs> yeah, it was a little. Weird. His brother has to marry his wife. That's correct. It's a rare. It's yeah. a rare uh, yeah. ceremony, but it happens. Just recently, uh, it happened, and his video is going around about it. Anyway. This, this is still practiced? Yeah, it's still practiced. Yeah, she, otherwise, you can't get married. Otherwise, you can't get remarried, yeah. Even yeah, today? Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a biblical law that he's not allowed... Stuff. It's actually a biblical law. It's a machlik, whether or not he's required to marry her and this is an out, or his option is to do one or two mitzvahs, either marry her or, or, or use, do, this, uh, do this divorce. I don't know of any cases of people who've, who've she, married. She can refuse it, though? She can refuse it, and then they do this, they do this procedure to let her... to. to to, re- to release her, this like preemptive divorce. In the I mean, past, they used to actually marry, but the, the problem is we don't have the right kavana, so they're concerned if you marry with the wrong intent. It's like marrying a sister in law, which is normally a car. Yeah. Yeah. This anyway. morning, they had the, they had the midnight of doing the, uh, doing the yibu. Of actually getting married. Yeah, getting married. And then the question was, he already has one wife. The Svartim, uh, actually yeah, if he already has one wife, and today we we have a prohibition against marrying right. twice, so no, he would have to do the chalitza. Right. But, but back in the old days, exactly. he's allowed to marry. Anyway, the point is like this: that the, this part of the rite is that he uh, that she uh, that he wears a shoe, a certain kind of he wears a certain shoe on his left foot, I want to say, and she pulls it off, and she spits and she throws it on the floor. It's a whole quite interesting procedure. Now the shoe has to be. A kosher shoe. So the problem is, and here's the, the legal definition between a sandal versus a shoe. A sandal is made out of one piece. Sandals used to be like one wrapping around the whole shoe, around the whole foot. And a shoe is made out of a few pieces sewn together. This is my understanding. Now, the problem is, so people use sandals uh, more commonly because they're much easier to make them a kosher sandal. If the shoe is missing some piece, then it's not a full, complete shoe. And because shoes are stitched, it's more likely for it to be a problem. Yeah, be about the, the, Sorry? The, 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 the mina was kind of as ordak, it's like a thin leather, not so, not so strong, and the sandal's strong. The sandal's stronger. Yeah. 
You know, the point being that, that the sandals are much easier to make, to make sure they're kosher sandals, yeah. as opposed to the shoes are harder to make them kosher shoes. So the custom was to use a sandal, and the, and the sages were, were uh, questioned about, about, the, about the shoe. And therefore, if the Yahu Hanavi came and said that you may use a shoe undoing our rabbinic concern about the shoe, so we would listen to him. But if he said you may not use a sandal, we wouldn't listen to him. Because for hundreds of generations, it's been our custom to use a sandal. That's how strong custom is. This is the point we're making here. Rav is saying the custom is so strong that even if the Yohan Avila himself were to come and say, you may not use a sandal, we would not listen to him. We would still continue using a sandal. But if he said we may use a shoe, when we were in doubt about it, okay, so he'll resolve our, resolve our doubt. But he can't undo that which we've been doing. Another version of the statement, it's a, it's, it's a very powerful yeah, idea about the custom of Jews. Kind of, uh, Sorry? It's almost like a checks and balances kind of system. In what way? Well, he, he has certain powers, but the people also yeah. have certain powers, and one has no yeah. more power than the other. In, in fact, in fact uh, uh, as we've talked about before, Torah is not in heaven, Torah is in this physical earth. And the rules of Torah dictate by Hashem's choice that conclusions are made by human beings who come to a conclusion. And if they've come to such a conclusion, even if heaven they came to a different one, Allah does not follow heaven. So Eliyahu and Eliyahu presumably is reporting on what, the, what they say in heaven. It doesn't matter to us. If he's, un, if he's resolving a doubt that we're in, okay, we'll take it. But if he's undoing our conclusion, we don't accept it. Even just by custom. But this really shows the power of Minhag Yisrael, right? That's right. This shows the power of Minhag Yisrael, how, how, how important Minhag is. He has the power only temporarily to... Uh, like, like a Navi, that's something else. Yeah, like Navi, he but I don't think Aliyah right. Navi here gets the halacha of Navi. I don't think over here Aliyah gets the halacha of Navi. Over here he gets the halacha more like we're talking about like Mashiach coming. I don't know if he means like a technical maybe prophet. prophet. Maybe. But, but it, only temporarily. But, but otherwise, he's anyway, like for Allah, like majority. So that's one version. Rabbah said in the name of Khan, in the name of Rav, that if Aliyah Navi come and said that you may use a shoe, we would listen to him because we're in doubt about that. But if he said you may not use a sandal, we wouldn't listen to him because it's already been our custom to use a sandal. So that was Rabba speaking in the name of Kana in the name of Rav. We have a different version now. Where Yosef speaks in the name of Kana in the name of Rav. The same, the same point is being made, but in a different fashion. Namely, if Eliyahu were to arrive, and tell us, you may not use a shoe. Again, we're in doubt about the shoe. So in the previous version, he says you may use a shoe. In this version, he says you may not use a shoe. So Shreem will never listen to him because we've been, we've been in doubt about it. In the first version, it says that if you... If he says you may use a shoe, we'll say yes. And if he says you may not use a shoe, we'll listen to him also in the second version. But if he came and said, sandal, you may not use a sandal, the conclusion is the same. The second half, where he tries to undo what we did, is the same. You may not use a sandal. In Shemla, we don't listen to him. Why should Kranago arm be sandal? Because we've already come we've already been practicing. It's been our custom for many generations to use a sandal. So the difference is only in the first half. In the second half, in both cases, El Yahu says, you may not use a sandal and we don't listen to him. In the first half, the question is, what does he say? Does he say, you may use a, a shoe? Or does he say, you may not use a shoe? And in each of those versions, we listen to him, either, whichever one he's saying. Because it was a doubt. Because it was a doubt. That's right. It resolves the doubt. That's right. Famina, now we're asking, before we get to the conclusion of our statement here, Abai is still telling Rav Yosef all of this, and proving that Rav is of the view that Minig is substantiated. And since our Minig today is, at least then, was to have stumas, to have closed spacing between the first and second partial so that's the way we do it because of the custom but the Gemara asks before we get to that the meaning of the Gemara asks and, and, sorry we say my benayu what's the difference between the two versions of Rav's statement whether Eliyahu he says you may use a sandal and we listen to, or you may use a shoe and we listen to him or whether he says you may not use a shoe and we, don't li- and we listen to him either case we're listening to him anyway the question is today can we use a shoe uh in the first instance. In other words, it's our, we're in doubt about shoe, right? So we use a sandal. But the question is, may we use nowadays an actual shoe? Like what if a sandal's not available? Yeah. Well, wouldn't it be, be a shoe? Let's say the sandal's not available. May you, may you use a shoe? How strong is our doubt nowadays? Is it, so, is it such a big doubt that we don't use it, let you use it at all? Or we say, better use a sandal or you may use a shoe? How, how would we infer it from the way in which the question's phrased about, from Abtelio? Because from the fact that in the first version, Eliyahu comes and says, you may use a shoe. The implication is that today we haven't been using shoes. And Eliyahu is coming and saying, you may use a shoe. 
Now, we weren't using shoe because of doubt. Now he's telling us you may use a shoe. Okay, you may use a shoe. But the implication is that till Eliyahu comes and says you may use a shoe, you shouldn't be using a shoe. Because we're in doubt about it. Whereas in the second version, when Eliyahu never comes along and says you may not use a shoe, implying that till he comes along and says that, there were instances where people did use, did use shoes. So, to put it this way, whichever version, it's better to use a sandal. And whichever version, if Eliyahu tries to come and undo our sandal custom, the answer is no, we're keeping to our sandal custom. The question is, what, have been, what, what, what has been or what is our attitude towards shoes? Is our attitude we're in doubt and therefore do not do it? And therefore when Eliyahu would come and speak about a shoe, what he would tell us is, you may use it. Or is our attitude towards shoes that if you have no, if you have no other choice, you may use a shoe. And therefore if Eliyahu is going to come and teach us something about a shoe, we already know you may use it. What you tell us is you may not use it. And then we'll listen to him also because we only let you do it because of our doubt. But the bottom line of all, you following? Yeah, I yeah. guess it depends on how the people view it. That's right. That time. Depending on how you view it at the time, that's the way you would have phrased El Yehoi's statement to you with regard to the shoe. But the point remains that irrespective of, your view, of what you want to say of shoe, we all agree that because our custom has been sandal, even if Leo comes and says no sandal, we still stick to sandal. And the point, therefore, being that Rav is of the view that customs that have been hallowed out by generations of doing it remain that way, irrespective of some higher authority, so to speak, saying something else. And therefore, when Shimon ben Elazar says, I observed from Rav Meir, that his mezuzah was an open-ended spacing, psucha is at the end of the first section, which ends the words of Yisharecha, is open to the end of the line. And v'hayim shemayah, the next paragraph begins at the beginning of the next line, which is psucha, that's an open-ended, Rav would not say that that's the halacha like him because our custom today is not to do it that way. Our custom today is to have a closed spacing between the two paragraphs. Even in our version, it's considered technically, like Tesis told us, also a closed paragraph, closed spacing. El Alav, therefore, we must conclude, says the Gemara. El Alav, is it not then? Shmami, no, we must conclude, Aravach, that when Rav said the halacha follows Shimon Lazar. He wasn't talking about the spacing between the paragraphs because there's already a t- determined custom, but rather he's talking about the margins at the top of the bottom, namely that the margins at the top of the bottom need to have some spacing for your clips to hold your parchment down so you can write properly. Shema Mina, this indeed is a good proof that this is what Rav intended. Okay. The Gemara, excuse me. The Gemara concludes this discussion by saying that which is quoted in the Shulchan Aruch, which we read already last week. Which is, Amar Rav Nachman Yitzchak, Amar Rav Nachman Son of Yitzchak said, Mitzvah Lasaisan Stumais. In best case scenario, you should make the spacing between the two paragraphs closed. That's the way it should be. That's the primary mitzvah. Via Abdin of but if you did it open ended, Shapadami, it's still okay. That's the way that the Shulchan Aruch says it. And we talked about this last week, how we, we kind of do like a shtickle hybrid. But the Gemara concludes, my psuchus to come Rabbi Shimon Lazar. So, what did Rabbi Shimon Lazar say when he when he said that I observed in Rabbi Meir that he had open ended mezuzahs, open open uh, paragraphs psuchus? So says the Gemara, ah psuchus. What he meant was not that you have to have it open, because that would be in contradiction to what we've been saying till now that they should be closed in the first instance. Especially, it's in contradiction to our custom, which Rav said overrides everything. Therefore, the Gemara interprets of Shemar Lazar to mean not that he had them all open, but af psuches, he had them also open. So, presumably, Rav had a few more, more than one mezuzah. And some mezuzahs were closed spaces and some were open spaces. And come to Shemar Lazar to tell us, you know, it's not like it has to be closed. If you had it open also, it's still okay. And that's talk our conclusion that it should be a closed space between the two paragraphs. But if it's open, it's okay. And we, as I said, we do like a kind of hybrid. Okay. Yeah, are you with me so far? Mm-hmm. All right. So now the Gemara is going to bring a, the Gemara is going to suggest a kind of support to the idea that um, in best case scenario, it should be open, it should be closed, I'm sorry, rather than open. What's the proof? So the Gemara says, the Gemara cites a text from the Mishnahic age, which says, is similar to this, whatever the context there is. It's talking about, uh, you'll see in a minute what it's talking about. The Gemara says, the Mishnah says, sorry, Sefer Torah, a Sefer Torah Shabbala, 
that's been that start to get uh, worn out. The tefillin and tefillin shabala would start to get worn out. Ain oisin mem You cannot use that part of the Torah, right? The Torah, the, the Shema that's in our mezuzah, that's in our mezuzah comes from the Torah. The Shema that's in the tefillin comes from the Torah. So don't take that section of the Torah, which is the Shema, and use it for your mezuzah. So your Torah is ruined. It's starting to get rubbed out, starting to get worn out. But you can still salvage that little part which says the Shema. So cut it out, roll it up, make a mezuzah. Says the Gemara, you can't do that. Who would think of such a thing anyway? Somebody who can't afford to pay for mezuzah, I suppose. <laughs> but why can't you do that? Says the Gemara, here's the key. Because the halacha is, you're not allowed to go, you're not allowed to take something and make it descend from a higher Kedusha to a lower Kedusha. Mm. So in the order of levels of Kedusha, the mezuzah is lowest, then goes to Tefillin, then goes to Fertura. And therefore, once, the ter- once this parchment and this ink and this writing has been designated for a higher level of holiness in the Sefer Torah, it cannot be demoted to mezuzah. And that's why it says by like this. Because the Gemara there is talking about scenarios of things that can elevate and not denigrate. Go higher in holiness, not lower. This is, this is the halachic source for this idea. That Milan Bakodesh, we always increase in holiness rather than decrease in holiness. We had this in Bracha, some, some elements of this, right? Yeah, it could be. Yes, 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 about, about, about using wine, yeah, not using wine for a lower, yeah, yes, I remember something like this. Okay. Wine that you used for higher Kedusha, not to take it, then use it for lower Kedusha. Right? We had something similar to this. Mm-hmm. It rings a bell, I don't remember exactly, yeah. but yes, I think, you're, I think you're right about that. At any rate, so we always, saw about, we always talk about this idea of increasing in holiness as a kind of metaphor for always moving forward. But the basic halachic idea is this, that something which has been designated for a higher level of holiness, like for a cemetery, can it be demoted to a mezuzah? Yeah, but... I would think that this scenario would be a Torah that's puzzle. Let's say puzzle. So, you, but that section of the Shema is it's not, still okay. It's good. So you say, okay, the Torah is puzzle. It's not even. Um, it's not even uh, salvageable. Salvageable. Yeah. So we might as well cut. We can at least cut that out mm. and, and use it as a mezuzah. The Gemara is saying still no. What, what, I don't see what would be wrong because I mean it's, it's been designated at a, a higher level of holiness. It's a high level anyway because it's puzzle. The whole Torah is puzzle. Yeah, it's. Like the Gemara doesn't say that it's possible, says that it starts to get rubbed out. But even if it's possible, the halacha still stands. Hmm. It's already been, it's either, in other words, it, has, it, it should be interned. Part of, it was, it was yeah. part of a higher It's, it's interned at its level of holiness uh-huh. and not taken, not demoted. But here's the point. In a way, it's erasing it in a way because if it's possible, so you're putting away the Torah, you're burying it. Yeah. And that passage is no longer, at least here, you're salvaging it and putting it into something that just has no, to yeah, be again. Anyway, whatever. It, it's, a, it's demoting it. I, I, yeah. I can't. Uh, it's a principle. It's a principle. it's a principle. We don't demote. But what's the point here? What's the point here? The Gemara is like this. The the, the Sorry? The Parsha is the question. Worth question. The Parsha is how can you combine them with two? Let's, we'll get to that in a second. The but first, the Gemara asks like this. The implication is that the reason why you say for Torah or that section of the Torah, of the Torah which says Shema or Vahayim Shema you cannot be used in a mezuzah is because you may not demote uh, uh, its holiness from a Torah to a mezuzah. But the Gemara says, Hamaridin, that means if we didn't have this principle of, of you may not demote it. Let's say we allowed you to demote holiness. Then Oisin, you would make a Sefer Torah into mezuzah. The implication therefore being that the writing in the mezuzah is the same as the writing in a, the writing in the mezuzah, the same thing as the writing is in, a, in a Torah. Am I? How is that possible? Hachas Tumais, Hachas in a Torah, it's an open-ended spacing. No, in the Torah, it's it's open. Sorry, uh, no, no, sorry, yeah, yeah. In the Torah, it's closed. In the Torah, the paragraphs following Shema, the, the paragraph following the spacing following following the the section of Shema is closed. Whereas in the Torah, whereas in the mezuzah, it's it's open, right? And therefore, this is kind of a support for the idea that either way, it's kosher. Because otherwise, the whole demotion thing wouldn't be the problem. The problem would be that it's written differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So says the Gemara, one second, you can't bring a proof from here. Why? Dilma lahashlem. Maybe this means to complete your mezuzah. Mezuzah is missing a line, and you complete it. What does this mean? How do you complete a mezuzah from using some other text from the Torah? So we're going to focus on this for a little bit. Let's look at the Rashi and then the Taisvis. We'll see two options. Actually, no, this goes straight to the Taisvis, because he incorporates Rashi also. Okay, so if you go to the Taisvis, uh, which is the big section on the bottom, on the bo- yeah, the left-hand side, which goes all the way to the bottom. So there's the words here, Dilma. 
the big bold words Dilma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's look at Dilma Lahashtan, perhaps, says the Gemara, that when the Mishnah says you're allowed to use, or the Mishnah implies that were it not for the principle of demotion, you will be allowed to use your Torah for mezuzah, and we try to use that as a proof that we're not particular about the opening ended or the closed ended spaces. Because they're different. In other words, the end of the halacha remains you may not demote your Torah anyway because of the demotion. But from the very fact that it relies on the demotion factor as opposed to the fact that it's written differently is, impl- is the implication is that it could be written this, that, they are, that they could be written the same. Right? Otherwise the Gemara would have cited that as the reason why you can't, do, you can't use your tefillin, your Torah for your mezuzah. Yeah? But the Gemara suggests maybe the reason why you're allowed to or maybe the reason why we need to rely on the principle of not demoting is because there's some other way you can use the Sefer Torah. And how is that? To complete your mezuzah. What does it mean to complete your mezuzah? How would you complete your mezuzah with some other Torah? So it says the says Torah is like this. Pirish Bekontris, Rashi explained. We didn't learn Rashi, but it's here. Actually, Torah is more elaborate than the Rashi itself. But Rashi says like this. Sheim Kuntris means pamphlet. And Rashi was referred to as the pamphlet because he was the only, at the time, the only readily available commentary and was published in a pamphlet alongside the Gemara. Not on the margins, but in a separate pamphlet. So Rashi is always referred to as the pamphlet, at least back in those days in France. So Pirish in the in the pamphlet it explains, Rashi says, Sheim chaser mezuzah shita achas, that if your mezuzah is missing one line, yilad in maridin, if it were not for the principle of you may not demote the Torah of two mezuzah, hayu noitin shita achser Torah, they would cut out that, you would cut out that one line of your Torah. Your Torah is, is being rubbed out anyway. You want to salvage it, were it not for the principle of demoting. So you can cut out your one line, the Torah from the mezuzah, and stitch it to the mezuzah. So here you have a halacha, at least, in the ver- at least according to Rashi, and it's seen according to Tesis too, that your mezuzah does not, does not have to be written on one parchment. It can be stitched together with a few. One line that you're missing, stitched to the rest of it, stitched to the rest of the mezuzah. Now, says the Gemara, says Tesis, and that which the Jerusalem Talmud, the Yerushalmi says, the Perekam of the Megillah, chapter 1 of Megillah, in the Yerushalmi, in the, in the Jerusalem Talmud, not the Babylonian Talmud, which we are studying. And what does it say there in the Jerusalem Talmud, in the Yerushalmi, the Tefillin and Mezuzis, that when it comes to Tefillin and Mezuzis, a Nikhtovim Ela al Echad must be written on one piece of leather, and not on more than, not on two, or three, and in this case, Rashi is suggesting, that you can take one line from an old Torah, were it not for the principle of demotion, were it not for the principle of not demoting something, you would take one line from your tefillin and stitch it to your mezuzah, one line from your Torah or from your tefillin and stitch it to your mezuzah. And here the Yashami says you may not use more than one parchment from mezuzah. Are you with me? Says the Gemara, says Taisu Sahi, that principle of not using more than one parchment, they weren't stitched together. In other words, the Yishami is saying not to have two or three loose pieces of parchment in your mezuzah, but if you stitch them all together, it'll be okay. Which is an interesting halacha. Irrespective of, what you're, irrespective of the issue of Torah, this teaches us something about mezuzahs. If I had scraps of parchment, can I stitch them all together to write my mezuzah? According to Torah, it'll merge it, you may. And therefore, the, and therefore, that's a suggestion for what the Mishnah might have meant, were it not for the principle of, you may not demote. And that you can take one line from your Torah and stitch it to the mezuzah. Now, Tesis gives another option. We might give another option where you don't need to rely on stitching. So how do you take a, how do you complete your mezuzah using a Torah um, um, without stitching? So it says like this. Going for example, the Parsha Shema, if the Parsha of Shema in your Torah, the Saif Omad, it happens to be at the end of the column, at the end of the page, the end of the column. Now, Halach is, we mentioned before, you have to have a margin in the bottom, at least the full tefach. So, now you add the parsha, the second parsha, into that margin. So, you took the Shema from your Torah, you have a whole margin under it, it happens to be written at the end of the line, and you write the next parsha into your margin, and you cut it out into a square mezuzah. Clear? It's rather simple, it's a very ingenious way of doing it. Or the other way around, the second parsha of the Shema, which begins with the Hoyim Shemaya, the Gilya, um, I'm sorry, you write you're right, you're right, you're right on the bottom margin. I or Parshish Vahim Shemaya Batilas Amud. If Parshish Vahim Shemaya, the second parsh of your of your mezuzah, which begins with Vahim Shemaya, was at the top of your paragraph and was at the top of the column in the Torah. So you have the margin on top. Vahis Shema Begilin Shalmailan, you add Shema 
and the margins in the top. How do you add it though? I mean, the stitches? No, no, no. no you're writing it. You have the Toyota has a margin. We're f trying to figure out how you would use it. So how you would use it? In. Not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not to see that, though. I'm just gonna ask. What? We learned the halacha here, which would, which would, uh, which should contradict Taisus. Yeah, because yeah, somebody said that was the only thing in, in common was the margins. No, no, no. We had, we had. There's a halacha that contradicts this. The margins are much smaller, right? The margins in the Torah are much bigger. They're like three tefachim on the three fingers on the top and a full tefach on the bottom, a full fist. In the mezuzah, it's just enough for a clip, so it's very little. But there's something else we're missing here. We learned that a mezuzah has to be written in order. 